Welcome to episode 3 of Obsolete TV. It's a show about old technology, making it work, making it do fun and new things. Um, before I start this episode, I just want to say that you know I was trying out some new ways of filming, so some of the segments might be a little rough around the edges, you know, but I'm working on it, so hopefully it'll be a lot better for you next time. And uh, without further ado, we're going to go into the first segment, which is Betamax Basics. So what you have in front of you are beta tapes and a beta player. Now Betamax came out in 1975 as a, a means to replace 8mm high 8 stuffer home movies and eventually consumer movies. And um, it mainly competed with VHS. Now at the time, VHS was relatively new and um, for doing home movies and stuff you had to have this camcorder which you basically hold like a normal camcorder but then you also had to carry around a VCR with you and that created a lot of hassle now Betamax what they did when they came out is they said alright let's put all that in one thing so they had a recorder and a camcorder all in one unit and they were the first to do that between Betamax and VHS so you also might notice the size of the beta tape here and just to show you Here's a VHS tape, so as you can see, beta is a little bit shorter. I'll take it out here. You might recognize this particular tape from the introduction sequence. This is just a blank tape. Uh, you can see there's how a VHS would normally have two window holes. This one only has one. The other is covered up by a label. Now, the, there was also something called the Format War, which occurred between VHS and Betamax. Uh, Betamax, a lot of uh, video files out there will tell you, is a much better format, and that it was way ahead of its time. There was a lot more engineering put into it. And um, the actual interesting thing about Betamax was the way that it uh, used the heads of the player to do chroma and luma settings which are color and brightness and um, on VHS you had it doing it where it would use um, it's called a band guard and that would just create you know like a little gap of frequencies but what uh, Betamax did was they used different angles and that created a lot less interference between the chroma and the luma so it had a much clearer picture um, Betamax tapes also had a higher resolution by, I believe, about like a width of 10 pixels or something. And uh, it also had, the player had a bunch of different features that VHS would usually take away and adapt to VHS later, such as freeze frame and uh, a bunch of other stuff. And uh, show you here, these are just some blank tapes. Uh, Sony brand blank tapes, you know. Another Kodak blank tape. So this is what you you know you get at the store or something. And then here, these are actual films on beta. This is a uh, Wild Times and Once Upon a Time in America. Now, open it up here. You can see there's it's a two tape set here. And uh, something else interesting about Betamax is uh, the record time. Originally, I think it was something like maybe an hour. And um, then, you know, VHS has this two hour record time with SP mode. So then Betamax did something called Beta 2, which just makes it go a little bit slower. So the picture's a little bit less, but it's a two hour record time. And um, the thing with that actually is that it shrunk down the resolution by that 10 pixels and made Betamax and VHS pretty similar. So, I'm going to talk about the player now for a bit. Uh, this is an older player. It's a Sanyo. And um, I believe Sanyo at the time, this was called a Beta Chord player. I'm not sure if they weren't allowed to use the Betamax name but uh, it has the beta logo on it and you might also recognize this from the introduction sequence but uh, looking at this player here try to go over some stuff um, 
Of course you have, you know, your record button, rewind, play, fast forward, stop, pause. Down here you have timer, off button, on button. You have your tape speed, so beta 2, beta 3. You have a tracking knob down here. Now over here, you have these channels. So, you know, you can hook this up to an antenna and you can program in your own channels. Regular VCRs, you know, VHS VCRs, they do this as well. And then eventually it went to automatic channels. And then down here, you have some weird settings going on. Like you can turn these knobs and stuff, and there's these switches. I'm not really sure what those do. You can try to figure that out. I'm not really sure. I think it's for recording or something like that. But because when I play back a normal movie, adjusting these doesn't change anything. So now, the top of the player here, you just hit this button and it pops up. And that was also similar to a lot of VHS players at the time. I mean, now everything is front load, but it used to be all top load. Now, on the back here, you have your standard, you know, channel 3, channel 4, antenna in, antenna out. This is a remote pause port right here, so I think if you hook this up into another Sony product and you hit pause on that, it'll pause on this too, like a stereo or something, probably a television. Then you have your video in, audio in, video out, audio out. So this appears to be in mono. And then you also have remote over here. This is probably something else with the remote so that you can control this through another machine. Now, on top of this beta player, this one I got for free in the trash. It actually works, which was pretty interesting to me. Um, I have this dusty old thing right here. Now, this is a Sony brand Betamax player. This one doesn't work. I think I spent uh, 10 bucks on this. I'll go through it. I mean, this is a front load, so this one's a little bit later. Uh, you have your power button. You have your headphone level if you want to hook in some headphone jacks. Now, right here, this is basically the recording powerhouse if you want to record stuff. Um, you have Super Beta, so if you have a Super Beta tape, I guess. Uh, sharpness tracking, slow tracking, whatever that is, uh, audio monitor, hi-fi or normal, audio or stereo, recording mode for beta 2 or 3, normal audio, manual audio, input select from the tuner or the line, an MPX filter, not sure what that is, and a hi-fi monitor, and then you, know, you have your TV VCR button, clear, reset, tape return, clock set, all this clock stuff here, you know, your control buttons, rewind, play, stop, pause, record, and you also have a frame button over here, so you can see a little bit better, so I guess this is like frame progression, and then you can do like a slow motion, one out of ten, one out of five, and if you go all the way over here, this is like your audio kind of processing area, so you can have your record level from you know left to right and then I'm sure it comes up here with like an equalizer or something but as I said this one doesn't work so I don't know if I could ever get this working um, then this slot here you also have some adjustment some tuning this is all channel stuff right here and uh, now I'm going to show you how to use a Betamax so now I have the Betamax player plugged in to the television using the composite ports. Uh, television's nothing special, just a little CRT TV. And uh, now I'm going to show you how to play the tapes. So you just hit the button up, take the tape, and pop it in. And now just go over here to the play button, and hit play. It makes a nice grinding noise, which is always good, as you can see. TV is doing something here. And there goes the tape, as you can see. Probably look a little bit weird on the camera, but uh, it's working. And there you have your Prism Entertainment screen here, putting a new light in home video, which we all know that Betamax did. So, turn this off for a sneak preview.
And uh, that's Betamax. I hope you liked that segment. Something else that's interesting about Betamax is that there was no copy protection at all. So if you ever tried to copy a VHS tape to another tape, like a commercial tape, like a movie or something, usually you'd probably end up with some weird coloring on your duplicate tape, which was because of macrovision. Now the same thing happens if you take a DVD and you run it through your VCR and you try to record it, it won't record properly. With Betamax, there wasn't any copy protection at all, so you just copy from tape to tape to tape, just keep going, perfect, well not perfect, but pretty perfect copies after every duplication. So without further ado, we're going to go into our next segment, which is vocoding with the stylophone. So what I have here is the stylophone. Now the stylophone is a pocket synthesizer. Uh, I'll show you turn it on here. Pop out this little wand. So you can use it as a synthesizer, make music. Over here you have your power switch. You have your vibrato. I'll show you a demo of that. So without vibrato and with And then up on the side here, there's a volume knob. There's uh, three different tone sets you can use here. So, show you the original, and then go to two. It's a more metallic kind of sound, and then three is a higher pitch. So you have three total sounds. Uh, on the side here, you have an MP3 jack, and you have a headphone jack. On the back, you can see it takes three AA batteries, and there's also a pitch knob here. So, if I play a note, and then use the knob on the back. You can do fun stuff like that. Um, this is a reproduction stylophone. Originally, they were from the 1960s, I believe, and they were marketed as a children's toy. Uh, there's two different models. There's the one you see in front of you, and there's a much larger one with a uh, larger pad here. And uh, it was actually used in some bands. For instance, uh, David Bowie used the stylophone in the beginning of his song Space Oddity. And uh, the man Kraftwerk used stylophones a lot. Um, as I said, this one's not an original 60s model, it's a reproduction. You can get these on uh, thinkgeek.com. This one ran about 11 bucks, I believe. And uh, today I'm going to show you how you can use this synthesizer to do some vocoding. So here I have Audacity, which is a great free sound editor. And um, if you don't know what a vocoder is, it's a combination between voice and encoder. It takes a human voice and it filters out the frequencies and then filters in another sound to change the sound of the voice. It's commonly used for sending like encoded transmissions. Now I've hooked up the stylophone through the line in jack on my computer with the headphone jack of the stylophone and now I'm going to record some sounds. Okay, so that end one was a good one. So I'm going to take that and I'm going to cut it. And then I'm going to put it into its own thing. And I'm going to export it as a WAV file. I'm going to need to do this because uh, the program Xerus Vocoder requires WAV files. And save it as stylo.wave, just so I know what it is. And now I'm going to go into Xerus Vocoder. This is a great free program. I'll have a link to this up. And uh, the modulator file, I'm actually, I have it already specified. There's a modulator file that's included with the program. So just use that. It's a simple voice counting. And then uh, carrier file is my stylophone file. So I'll select that. And the output file, just something I named. Testing one, two, three. 
that's what all the files sound like. You, you, there's some options here. You might want to play around with those. I'm just going to leave them as default for now, and then I'm going to hit vocode. And that's it. The file's done encoding. So now I can go listen to it. Alright, and if I wanted to check out things, this is a great tool called Spectro. Now I'm going to open the file here. And uh, Spectro is a pretty great tool. Um, I believe I found it from the website what.cd. Basically, it's normally used to check to see if any of your music is from the correct source. For example, like if you have a FLAC file, you want it to be lossless. You don't want it to be like a transcoded, like a 128 kilobit per second file. Uh, so it's great to check out your own audio files just to make sure they're not duds. I'm going to open the modulator file that came with the program. This is the simple counting voice. And we're going to check that out. So this is what that file looks like. See that right there. And uh, next I'm going to open, I believe, the stylophone file. And you can definitely see how tweaking the knob on the back of the stylophone changes stuff up here. And now opening up the final file, the test file. And this test file here is a combination of the two files. So you can kind of see how those two come together to create a pretty interesting file. And that's it for the stylophone segment. Hope you enjoyed it. All the links should be available in the show notes. Hope you guys liked that segment. That one was a little bit tough for me to do because I haven't fooled around with screen capturing for quite a while, but I think I got that one down pretty good. Um, going to the contest, we had some contest winners last episode. I believe the first was Gamer Goddess's brother or brother-in-law, but uh, he found out the telephone number that I was doing in DTMF the last episode and called up my voicemail, left the message, and then Gamer Goddess left a message. And then also, uh, a user on IRC named Mation left the message, and I'll be playing these messages in the end credits. Uh, there's no contest for this episode, but hopefully there will be in future episodes. And now we're going to go up to the final segment, which is real to real players. So in front of you, we have a couple of tape reels here. Uh, a couple of them are blank, such as these two. And uh, if you open them up here, you have a 7-inch reel, which uses quarter-inch magnetic tape. Now, uh, the packaging here, there's some tips for making better recordings. If we move on to some of the, you know, commercial stuff, we have reels like this, some more blank tape, and uh, you can see one here for Martin Denny's Golden Greats. And uh, if you look in the upper corner here, you can see that it says seven and a half IPS. IPS stands for inches per second. So all these tapes had different sound quality depending on inches per second. Kind of like how if you have, you know, a VHS tape, you can do EP, SP, SLP recording stuff like that. Um, seven and a half inches per second was probably the highest quality for home recordings and the lowest quality for professional recordings. Professional recording usually used 15 inches per second or higher and they had a uh, 10 inch reels instead of these 7 inch reels and they had wider hubs in the middle but uh, for home recording the highest quality was 7.5 IPS and then you could also have I believe 3.5 IPS and 1.25 and IPS and if you record something on 1.25 IPS you could probably have a reel going like all day with sound. It's not very good sound, but you can have a lot of stuff going on. And now, pushing these to the side, show you this recorder right here. And uh, this is a Concord reel to reel machine. And uh, this is probably used in schools or basically non professional use, maybe someone recording themselves singing, something like that. Over here, you have tape speed. Down here, there's a knob, you have volume, you have tone, and then if you look here, these kind of piano key buttons down at the bottom, 
which has play, fast forward, stop. Also has uh, cue and record buttons, so I'm guessing this has a built-in microphone. And this also has a built-in speaker. The problem is the speaker isn't really reliable, so I would show that off, but it would just cause more problems than it's worth. And I'll show you another real to real machine next. Move this one aside. So this is a Tandberg reel-to-reel -reel machine. Uh, this is probably pretty good for home use. This might be a top-of-the-line model. Tandberg is actually still around. They do uh, like intercom devices, stuff like that. And uh, showing off this machine, up here you have a switch which controls tape speed. Let's zoom in on that. So you have one and a quarter, it's three and three fourths, and seven and a half inches. So, that's how many inches per second you could have there. Move down into this corner, you have your on switch and your record button. You have your input levels if you want to input using. And here you can see microphones, or there's a line in the back, which I'll show you. And then you have these two red buttons, which are record select for left and right channels. You have a headphone jack. You have an S on S jack. I'm not sure what that does. I just leave it on normal. And you have your source, for your tape. So you can, if you choose to have them out, then that's your source. That's the auxiliary in on the back. If you press them down, that just plays from the tape. And then. Up here you have your tape counter up top, and your fast forward, and your play buttons, and your rewind buttons, stuff like that. I'll show you. And you're just going, that way would be rewind, that's play, and this is stop. I don't know why you have your free button here, you can just use that for stop. And then if you look over here under the B, there's a little switch back and forth. That does start and stop as well kind of an interesting design why they would choose to do it there and uh, I'm going to show you how to load a tape on this. Most times when you have a reel to reel you'd get an empty reel kind of like this one. This isn't officially an empty reel. It looks like somebody took something and they cut it out so it could be used as an empty reel. This isn't too good but I'm going to use it just because it's on here right now. Now if you remember earlier the Golden Greats Martin Denny now, I'll show you how to load this one real quick. You might notice here, let me zoom in for a second. You have these black locks that are on top of these sort of silver locks. They both basically look the same. Now, if I put a reel on, make sure the tape's facing the right way. Now, that slides in right there. Now, you take this black part you pull it out and you twist it so that way it locks in you can't pull the reel out see that okay now I have my reel in here now there's some hanging off here a little bit and then just take that and get a little bit feed it through the middle then up in here since this isn't a right reel, I kind of have to mess with it a little. I'm going to hold it here at the top. And then I'm going to turn it so that it locks it in a bit. And now I need to lock this reel. I'm going to give it a couple more turns. Make sure it works all right. That seems to be working. Now let me show you the back real quick. Now on the back here, down at the bottom, you have, right here is your line in, and this uses, you know, your standard RCA jacks, and this is your line out. Now what I'm going to be doing is, I have just some standard, you know, RCA cable that you'd find with a stereo, and I'm going to hook that up to the line out. Now you might be hearing a little bit of static because of what I'm going to show you next. Now, turn this machine back around. So we have 
that's ready to go. Let me turn that on. And over here, so here's a Helix boombox. Now, if you want me to do a segment on boomboxes, I will. Um, I'm not really going to cover it in this episode. This was a pretty good top of the line boombox at its time. On the back, it has a uh, line in for auxiliary and for phono, so you could even hook a record player up to this. But right now, I'm just using it for the line in. And uh, as you can see, lights on, which means it's on. And now, if I should do the play button here, let me make sure the tape is chosen. Yep. Then this should play this tape. I'm not sure if it will because it's been having some problems, but let's give it a try. Okay, so as you can see, it plays the tape pretty well. Um, now the top here, some interesting stuff that we can do is we can try the tape at a different speed. So let me put it up there and hit play. That plays it slow, and then we can go even slower. And you may be asking yourself, you know, why do this? Why play it at different speeds? Actually, the reel-to-reel -reel machine has been used several times for actually, like, a musical instrument. So bands such as uh, Frank Zappa would do stuff where he'd record stuff on here, play it forwards, backwards. Uh, Pink Floyd would do this. The Beatles would even do stuff like this, and just using the reel-to-reel -reel player as an instrument. And, um... Something interesting to note is that when editing with the magnetic tape, you can actually cut the tape and you can tape it with other tapes to make sequences. Now the thing with reel to reel is, is if you have a master copy, putting it to another tape would already decrease the quality. So it would only be 75% to 90% of the quality of the first tape. So when you're doing editing, you have to make a sacrifice to either destroy the original master tape and chop it up into pieces and then splice it together, or you'd have to make a copy and then have lower sound quality and then do your editing. So these things weren't very efficient, but they were very interesting. And uh, finally, I'm going to show you another reel-to-reel -reel player. This is probably my favorite. Now, what you can kind of see in front of you is an Akai reel-to-reel -reel player. This one's significantly more heavy than the other one. But, uh, so Akai is probably one of the best known brands in reel-to-reel -reel players. Uh, it's a Japanese company, and they currently make a lot of electronics, like general electronics, like washing machines and stuff like that. And, um, the reel-to-reel -reel players are really well known, uh, even for parts. Like one of them on eBay goes for a ridiculous amount broken. Something like, I don't know, maybe 200 bucks for a broken one. And uh, the one that I have right now, it's in pretty good shape. It needs a new replacement cord, but uh, otherwise it's pretty good. And what I'm going to be doing with this one is I'm going to show you some of the recording features of Reel to Reel. Now this, I already have a tape threaded here. Uh, as you can see, it's a little bit more complicated. I'm going to zoom in a bit. So down here you have to feed the tape a special way. And uh, you have the spinning part right there which propels the tape. And then you have to get it up through here. This thing actually makes it so you can hold the play button and all the buttons down, stuff like that. I don't know why they chose to do that, I guess it's something of a fail safe. Uh, over here, you have your power button, you have a switch between tape and source, you have your tape speed, you have a tape selector, you have low noise, wide range, phones, microphone input, you have your output, and then over here, you have your sources for microphone, 
and line in on the bottom and then you have your switches, pause, rewind, stop, play, your tape direction, stuff like that. Now for this I'm gonna go grab my mp3 player. So this is just a regular old iPod and uh, this cord right here is plugged into the line in. So I plug that in and then I have the obsolete theme song queued up here. So as you can see I have the record button and the play button. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold these two buttons down and that starts the tape spinning. Now we're in the magnetic tape part, not the leading strip which is white. And I'm going to hit the play button. And I have to switch this to source I believe. And now it's actually recording. You just heard it playing through. And so I'm going to let this record for a little bit and uh, see how that's going. And now I'm going to stop it. I'm going to stop the tape. I'm going to rewind it. This is going to have to be an exact science here. I'm trying to stop this tape before it runs out. Alright. Got lucky on that one. Now I hit the play button. i to switch this back to tape. And you should be able to hear what I just recorded. I'll just unplug the iPod. Well, as you can see, that kind of worked strangely. Let me rewind it and try again here. So it looks like there was a couple problems with playback. It's not a perfect system, but I can at least attempt to show it off. And there you go. You can hear the theme song coming through there. Raise the volume a bit. Now I can change the speed. Make it run faster. And that is the reel to reel player. Hope you guys enjoyed that. So that about wraps up this episode. Uh, as always, questions, comments, concerns, stuff can be emailed to me. And um, you can always go on the IRC. And uh, something new is that I'm uh, putting out torrents. So you can go up to the website, find a torrent link, and you can torrent. That might be faster than direct download since I'm using archive.org. And I'm also on iTunes now. So you can get this through iTunes and I believe a couple other sites that uh, do streaming in the same fashion as iTunes like Miro. So you can find information for that on the website. And um, that's it. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode and hope to see you for the next one. Oh, I'm sorry. I was calling for a sweepstakes. I didn't mean to call the wrong number. So, um, Sammy, you know, um, last night was so, so amazing. But next time, please leave the rooster at home. Thanks. Bye. Hi, this is Nation. And my way of life is based on obsolete technology. Hello. You're watching Dish Network's Pirate TV channel. Did you know you're not an authorized subscriber? That's right. I'm speaking to you on a channel that only someone receiving programming without proper authorization can view. So if you're watching me, you're a satellite pirate. <laughs>